Hey, my name is Mark, uh, Mark Burdett, MFB on Drupal.org, and um, I work at EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and we're a local nonprofit organization. Um, and also, we use Drupal, so um, that's partly why I'm here, I guess. <laughs> so, I've been part of the Drupal community for a while. Um, we are a legal support and advocacy organization for the internet and for internet users and um, technology in general. Uh, we were founded in 1990, um, which was really at a time when um, new technologies like the internet were taking off and um, there was no real legal understanding of what rights people should have or could have when they're using the internet um, as opposed to the meat space or <laughs> uh, real world as as it was, but now, nowadays I guess you know everyone's on the internet, and so we have a lot more overlap um, between meat space and cyberspace. So, um, but we're still around, and we are funded by members. We're a totally member-funded organization, so we get donations from people like you who use the internet and um, want to have their rights protected, rights to free speech, privacy, and other other things that make the internet a better place and a more useful place and a safer place um, for whatever we might be using it for. So um, we also use other technologies too, not just Drupal. Um, so we, uh, we're primarily a legal organization, so we mostly have lawyers uh, working in our office over in San Francisco. And we basically file lawsuits against um, whoever might be um, violating civil liberties on the internet, and oftentimes that might be US government, so we have a lot of lawsuits going on at any time. Um, we're suing the National Security Agency, uh, the DEA, other agencies that are doing warrantless mass surveillance. Um, we've also carved out rights to use open source technology at various times, like encryption technology. Um, Encryption technology is basically how everyone logs into their email and bank accounts on the internet every day. Um, but believe it or not, it was actually illegal when all that technology was created back in the you know, early 90s or so. Um, and so we actually had to file lawsuits to carve out the right to build this technology that's kind of like become part of the foundation of the internet. Um, we also carved out rights to fair use of content on the internet, so um, fair use for um, music, videos, all kinds of things. Um, oftentimes, um, the entertainment industry has cracked down on people's free expression online, and so we've carved out space um, to use copyrighted material when there's a fair use for that material, whether it's educational or, or whatever. Um, we also file what, what we call FOIA lawsuits. FOIA is Freedom of Information Act, and so this is when we want to make some kind of information that the government has public. So, um, so uh, basically, the, the legal avenue for that is that you file a Freedom of Information request to get some government information into the public domain so that people can access it. But oftentimes, the government doesn't want to do that, so we actually have to file a lawsuit to make um, government information more transparent. And so um, for all these different kinds of issues that we work on, um, we're basically constantly contacted by internet users who need legal help. So we actually have a free legal hotline whenever you run into legal problems on the internet. Maybe you get like a cease and desist uh, scary letter from a lawyer, or maybe you get some kind of legal order from uh, a court or law enforcement agency. You can basically email us for free legal assistance and we actually try to either provide our own lawyers as a resource to help you out or refer you to someone who can help you. Um, so this is huge for um, small organizations, small startups that don't have their own um, in-house counsel yet. So they can, so you can basically use us as a free legal clinic. So um, we also do a lot of research on threats that people face when they're using technology. Um, currently, we're doing research on things like stalkerware, which is um, mobile apps that people install to spy on other people, maybe their partner or ex-partner or whatever it might be. Uh, so um, stalkerware is, is basically um, malicious you know, iPhone apps and things that are actually out there, and people can basically install it on your phone without you knowing it. Um, 
We also are researching web trackers. Um, web tracking is a huge industry for everyone's like online habits to be monitored by the advertising industry and, and um, other other folks. And so we're kind of like looking at how people are abusing our data and uh, aggregating it, selling it, data mining it, and all that, and looking at ways that people could circumvent being tracked um, as you use the internet. Um, we're also looking at the US border, um, among, among many other places. I mean, we also do research here in the Bay Area on the streets of Oakland and Berkeley and elsewhere. But uh, currently, the US border is a real hot spot for, um, for new kinds of surveillance technology that the government is deploying. Um, so they have all kinds of face recognition, um, uh, automatic license plate readers, uh, stingrays, which are devices that basically track all of the mobile phones in the area. They're deploying all of this at the US border. They're also searching everyone's devices, not everyone's, but they're searching many people's devices um, as people cross the border. And they actually developed um, basically lists of people that they're interested in um, searching their devices. That includes journalists and lawyers who are working on human rights cases involving uh, migrants crossing the border. So there's just a lot going on related to privacy and technology that we're always um, working on as much as we can. Um, and we also build technology. Um, so some of these are things that we built in the past and kind of handed off to new organizations to maintain them. So Let's Encrypt is actually now a separate organization. Tor is a separate organization. But these are basically uh, tools that provide uh, more security and privacy. Um, Let's Encrypt gives you free HTTPS certificates for your website, so you can free of charge migrate from HTTP to HTTPS and kind of lock down your website to be more secure. Um, and that was a huge change because previously HTTPS was something you had to pay to play. You have to find a certificate authority and pay them money every year to maintain your certificate. So we kind of changed that industry completely and made it free of charge for anyone to use security for their website. Um, and Tor is a very popular, oh, CertBot is actually the tool that we maintain for generating the Let's Encrypt certificate. Um, Tor is a very popular um, uh, web browser and platform for surfing the web more anonymously. Um, it basically gives you a uh, kind of um, private channel through the internet to reach whatever website you're looking for um, without being tracked by your ISP or other people that might be monitoring your internet usage. Um, we also maintain a couple of browser plugins, HTTPS Everywhere, um, which kind of locks down your web browsing to use HTTPS as much as you possibly can. Um, and Privacy Badger is a um, another browser plugin that basically monitors what you're doing in your browser and it detects trackers that might be embedded without your knowledge on a, a website that you're looking at. Um, many popular sites like New York Times and everyone else use all kinds of different web trackers to basically get uh, information for their advertisers and, and marketers and so forth. So um, Privacy Badger detects third party trackers and actually blocks them so that you're not giving out all of your reading habits to every advertiser um, that might be embedded in every website that you visit. Um, so these are things you could actually install right now if you're interested. Um, and also we're hiring. So we're hiring for our, our web development team. So ff.org slash webdev if anyone is interested. OK, so today um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a new privacy law that is coming into play in California. Um, it's called the California Consumer Privacy Act. So this is one of the um, first kind of wide-ranging privacy regulations that is um, coming into force in a US state. Um, and that's going to be January 1st of 2020. And this comes in a context of a lot of different um, privacy headlines and concerns that people have. Um, a while back, you may remember the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, this was a scandal where uh, Facebook was collecting huge amounts of data 
turning it over to third parties to um, aggregate and analyze that data and then make it available to political campaigns and then political campaigns were able to inject content into people's feeds based on what they knew that they might be interested in through Facebook. So, um, you know, this is a, kind of a, like a lack of transparency of how much of our data was getting aggregated and sold to third parties, um, basically without people's consent. Um, because, uh, you know, there's not really any fine print that Facebook could write that would kind of um, excuse what they were doing for Cambridge Analytica. Um, and we've also had a lot of financial data leaks um, from credit reporting services and banks and other things. Um, they've had hacks and huge security holes. Um, also, Yahoo had a huge security hole a while back. So we've had a lot of data leaks of basically millions or hundreds of millions of people where, um, where you know, your name and address and financial history could be leaked out for anyone to access. Um, and then we also have a lot of new technologies that are related to privacy that are kind of constantly bubbling up and could potentially change the landscape. Um, currently, there's um, DNS over HTTPS. This is kind of um, a new technology that may be incorporated into web browsers soon, and it would kind of change like who's able to monitor um, your, your web browsing. Currently, everything that you do through your browser is probably um, all of the websites we're looking at are probably getting sent to your internet service provider because they're doing DNS queries. And so actually, um, ISPs are able to kind of develop uh, like kind of a dossier of what sites people are interested in and what sites uh, their specific subscribers are looking at. And um, so technologies like DNS over HTTPS will kind of change who has access to that data. It might not necessarily be an improvement, but in many cases it could be. It basically changes like which companies have access to the, to the DNS queries that you're that you're making when you uh, surf the web. So there's just kind of like a lot of a lot going on with privacy. Also, last year we had the um, GDPR, which came into effect in Europe, General Data Protection Regulation, and so that was one of the first like laws on the international stage that kind of changed the practices that websites need to employ for protecting privacy and also change like how consumers can like be aware of what's happening to their data and maybe control like maybe get it removed from the site entirely if they no longer want to share data with certain sites um, and then in the last couple of years we've also seen pushback from big tech companies who want to have access to all of our data <laughs> and because uh, that's part of their business model and so they generally don't like regulations like CCPA um, because it could affect their ability to keep gathering data and, and figuring out how to make money off of it. So um, also I, I want to point out that we have like laws are not always uh, protecting our privacy. There's also laws um, that take away our privacy rights and so that's another thing that we have to look at. Um, so currently there's a law um, that may come into play in Hong Kong where you won't be allowed to wear a mask on the street. So um, privacy laws can go both ways and you have to kind of be vigilant about if you're losing rights to privacy or, or gaining them. Um, so like I said, this new law is going into effect January 1st and we don't know what's, what it's going to do yet, honestly. <laughs> so this talk might be a little premature because basically the, the Attorney General for California hasn't actually issued the official guidance for how companies should be following this new law. So basically everyone, if you're maintaining um, you know, some kind of online business collecting data of your customers, you're gonna have to stay tuned to find out like, how the law is actually changing in the next three months or so. Um, and then in the meantime, there's also a talk about a new ballot measure that could be approved, or that could you know, collect signatures from voters, uh, this new ballot measure would be like yet another, they'd basically add on additional um, measures to CCPA to add even more um, new privacy regulations in California. So if that gets onto the ballot and passes next year, then that could mean in 2021 there's like a whole new set of privacy law, uh, laws in California that 
you might want to keep track of. So, um, but despite the fact that we don't know exactly how CCPA is going to be implemented, um, it's already been written, so we can at least read it and kind of make some uh, assumptions about what it's going to mean. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so the, this is basically a list of uh, of the new privacy rights that CCPA lays out for consumers in California, which basically means the residents of California. Um, so residents of California will now have, be able to know um, which personal data is being collected by um, companies that they're doing business with on the internet. Um, and they will also know um, if the personal data is being sold or disclosed to third parties. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that is oftentimes already in a privacy policy for, for, um, for many online sites today. But there is no law basically mandating that this had to be disclosed in the privacy policy until now. Um, so the big change is that um, California residents will be able to opt out of the sale of their personal data. Um, and that's specifically limited to the personal data that a website collects. So if Drupal.org um, collects um, my name and email address, I would be able to opt out of uh, Drupal.org selling that information to someone. But if Drupal.org somehow got information about me from some other source, and not from me myself, um, I can't actually stop them from selling that data because they bought it from someone else and they can do whatever they want with it. So CCPA is like a little, a little bit limited in that regard. It's basically talking about um, data that is being collected by the particular uh, website or service in question. Oh, yeah? So for that, it's not an automatic, like, I have to opt in, you have to opt out. It's um, assumed that they can. Yeah, yeah. So there has to be exposure. Um, and so you, you have to have a way to opt out. Um, yeah, and I, I would agree that, you know, ideally, uh, and I'll talk about this later, but I mean, the law isn't, doesn't follow the best practices that you have other things people should use. So certainly, like, we encourage people to be proactive about how they implement this stuff. What about third parties, um, things on your site that aren't, that you're not collecting, but a third party is through, like, Google Analytics or whatever? Yeah. So. That's who's something. Just, who's responsible for the yeah. lockdown? Yeah. So that's something that we're kind of um, researching right now, and the attorney general also needs to offer guidance. So um, we'll, EFF is probably going to have some blog posts coming out in the next three months where we talk about that. And so part of this is going to be my own like recommendations for what people do, and I would certainly say that that should be part of your privacy policy where you disclose the third-party services that you're that you're using and that. Um, you know, maybe even offer a way for people to opt out of using those services, but that's not clearly spelled out in the law, unfortunately. So, unless the attorney general does so in the next few months. Um, so, um, the fourth one is uh, you'd be able to access uh, kind of a list of what data a company has already collected about you. Um, so, some sites already have something like this, like Facebook lets you download supposedly everything, although it's probably not everything. <laughs> they, but they let you download a lot of information from Facebook to see, to see what they have there. Um, this would basically legally mandate that kind of service to be available. It wouldn't necessarily have to be fully automated um, the way that the Facebook system works. But it's probably a good idea to automate it, at least in the long term, because if you had a lot of users requesting their data from your web application, you probably want to streamline that and you don't want to have support staff constantly like doing database queries to get the information and then like put it into an email and send it to the end user. Um, so there needs to be some system in place for people to like find out what data you have, whether that's manual or automated, it's, it would be up to you. Um, and then there's a right to ask for that information to be deleted. Um, and obviously there could be exceptions to this in the case of like some kind of legal compliance thing where you know obviously a bank 
probably isn't legally allowed to just randomly delete your data. They have various other regulations in place for their industry. Um, so, you know, this is not an absolute rule that any data could be deleted, but um, basically if you were to refuse to delete information, you could be facing um, some kind of nasty gram from a lawyer. So it's, you know, something to um, consider being able to handle. And, and then finally, you wouldn't be discriminated against for being like the one user who's really whiny about their privacy rights. <laughs> so, um, you know, basically companies would have to allow you to request for your information to be deleted and they wouldn't be able to like um, cancel your service just because of that. And if they did, then you could potentially sue them for some kind of damages in that case. Um, so, um, this is kind of a, a list of things that, um, actually let me talk real quick about who it applies to. So, um, one, one good thing is that if you're like a tiny business, the CCPA might not actually apply to you um, because it does limit it to for-profit companies with annual revenue of over $25 million and uh, personal information of 50,000 or more um, entities. And the entities could be people or households or devices. So this is actually... Um, an improvement over the GDPR regulation in Europe because the GDPR regulation it basically is mainly talking about the information of European citizens. Um, but the California law um, also talks about households and devices. So even if the information that you're gathering is just like some kind of identifier for a phone or for you know an address on the street, um, that would still be considered somebody's personal information, and and that household would have, you know, a right to have their information removed. Oh yeah. So not government, not um, nonprofits. No. Right. I mean, as far as I understand, I'm not a lawyer, so but my understanding of of the law is basically it's for profit businesses. So there's a huge loophole for local governments to collect information. Hopefully there would be other procedures to get your information removed from those kinds of sites. Um, so, but you know, again, like this could change in terms of what the attorney general says about how they, they want to implement it. Yeah. Well, our organization possesses, possesses fifty thousand, more than fifty thousand people, and we're not for profit. Right. So, so it seems like it might not apply to you, but I'm not a lawyer, so I think that you know. <laughs> I, the law does talk about for-profit businesses, uh, so I, I think they, they're excluding nonprofits, but I don't want to guarantee that, so you know, you should probably follow. Um, Here on the side of caution and privacy aspect, you yeah. support that. Yeah. And yeah, and your users might be expecting you to follow kind of industry practices regardless. Um, so I think it could be a good idea to at least be aware um, of what everyone's kind of expecting going forward. Um, also, this would basically apply to every company, no matter how small, if you make your money off of consumer data. So if you're doing some kind of um, data aggregating and, and data mining and that sort of thing, you, no matter how small you are, you would have to follow the new rules. So, so there's a question on, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, so those bullet points are all boards? Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so these are basically as long as you are in one of these three buckets. Okay. Yeah. I think one of the three, you have to hit three of those things. Yeah. In order to, but you saw before. No. 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 You, it's anywhere. the first one and any of the lower. Yeah. yeah. I should have used the first one and the yeah. lower. Yeah. And yeah. And yeah. 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 Next time I'll write it in code so it's more clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a bunch of other rules that it lays out. Um, if you know, once you decide that you're gonna follow the that you need to follow the law, or that you want to follow the law, because it's a good idea. <laughs> um, so um, you have this is not a direct. This is a fairly direct quote. Implement and maintain reasonable security procedures and practices. So that's a huge gray area, but. Basically, a jury, I guess, if you if there was a lawsuit that came out of this, a jury would basically get to decide if you were being reasonable um, 
with your security procedures. And so this is basically addressing the issue of um, you know data breaches where um, information isn't being properly protected um, and people are getting access to it that way. So um, also there's new rules about parental consent for children under 13 as well as how um, kids 13 to 16 need to um, affirmatively consent for their information to be uh, tracked. And so that basically means um, kids can still be tracked and they're probably going to click through without fully understanding what they're clicking on. Um, so that's a little bit unfortunate. <laughs> um, also, uh, you need to have an opt-out link on your homepage. So it needs to be really easy and obvious for people to follow that opt-out procedure that you're supposed to implement. Um, and then there's actually a requirement for a toll-free number, as far as my reading of the law goes. Uh, I'm not, again, I'm not a lawyer. But it actually mentions having a toll-free number um, as one of the avenues for, um, for people to get in contact with you. I guess, presumably, if you're a large company, you might already have a toll-free number. So that might not be an issue. Um, and then um, you need to update the privacy policy to take into account all of the new laws. Um, there's already a California law that you're supposed to have a privacy policy, both on your website and also if you have a mobile app. The mobile app needs to have a privacy policy. So everyone should already have one of these, hopefully. <laughs> um, but you need to update it. Uh, you can't be stuck in the past if, you know, with your, the 2005 version of your privacy policy. Um, and then there's a rule about if somebody opts out of having their information uh, collected and sold, um, you can't trick them into opting in um, before a year has expired. So that kind of implies that you probably, I guess, need to at least keep their information around so that you can, so that you know that, <laughs> so that you can follow this law. So, I mean, if somebody demanded that you remove their email address and everything else, I guess that would be difficult to know if they'd already opted out. So, my, my reading of it, and I'm not a lawyer, my reading of it is that you would, in that case, like, keep some information around so that you could see that they had opted out and could maintain that status for the next year. And then you could purge the record completely. So there's a difference between, they're, they're, they're sort of, Identifying a difference between opting out of something versus not the right to be forgotten, for example, so the deletion of everything. Yeah. Yeah, because if you delete everything and I delete your email address, now I shouldn't be able to do that. For now, I'm going to ask you the next time you're on my website to opt back in. Where this is saying that if you're opting out. Yeah, so you're not supposed to have a. Like if somebody opted out and then you know they come back to your website and buy another widget. You're not supposed to have an opt-in checkbox for them um, if they already opted out. We're just talking about the, op the, the sale of personal data, opt-in, opt-out? Yeah. Or, yeah. Oh. Um, okay, so I did that. So um, there's um, basically personal information is pretty much everything that you might think is personal information. Um, and so there's not like an exhaustive list in the law, but it's basically everything that could um, link to an, a particular individual household or device. So that's like names, uh, personal identifiers, address, IP address, email address, social security, driver's license, uh, also your you know education, employment, and medical information. Um, basically everything. Um, <laughs> that you might think of. And um, like I said, this in, um, there are differences with the GDPR. So, um, so one thing about GDPR is that it basically covers all the information that you have about someone, regardless of where you got it from. But CCPA is, is just talking about the information that you literally collected from your user or the consumer. Um, it's not talking about information that you got from other sources. So if you are, if you need to follow both GDPR and CCPA, you basically, um, I mean, you can basically have as expansive a privacy policy as possible that kind of works for all of them. Um, or 
technically speaking, you could like choose to implement it differently for European residents versus California residents. I think that could get really complicated once every jurisdiction on the planet has its own privacy regulations. So I'm not sure what the end game of that would be. But um, yeah, that's basically where we're headed is that every state might have its own privacy law at some point in the future. Is there going to be a federal privacy policy? Um, yeah, so actually this is like a potential concern right now is that the, uh, the tech industry is, or at least parts of the tech industry, are pushing for a federal regulation that would allow them to water down more stringent state regulations. So it's kind of the same with EPA where, you know, EPA lets a lot more polluting cars onto the street than California does. So the a federal regulation would improve things in some states that don't have a regulation, but it could um, be a setback for California. So um, I want to talk a little bit about best practices, like regardless of what happens in the next um, three months to a year with CCPA, because um, I think it's important for like people to basically earn the trust of their users and respect their privacy, you know, regardless of how the laws are constantly changing. So, um, so everyone, like I said, just have a privacy policy on their website, hopefully. And if you're building a web a website for a client, um, then maybe remind your client that they need they need to have a privacy policy if they don't already. Um, it's one of those basic links that should be on every homepage, along with you know about us and contact us and all that stuff. So, um, and once you have, or when you're writing your privacy policy, part of that process should be um, auditing all of the information that you're collecting about your users. And as well as looking at the third party services that you use and what information you're sending to them. And so that's gonna be an important part of certainly GDPR compliance. Because um, GDPR clients like, expects everyone to basically figure out all of their uh, data processors. That's the GDPR term for like everyone that you're. If you're collecting some information about your users, um, you're basically the data controller. But then you have data processors uh, that are receiving that data and doing something with it for you, like providing credit card payments or something else for you. So you need to like basically keep track of all the data processors that you're using. And um, so this could be information that would end up in your privacy policy where you specify, you know, oh, so if you subscribe to our newsletter, we'll send your information to our newsletter service, which is MailChimp or whatever third party service that might be. Um, also, it's a really good idea to have a retention policy. Um, and this is certainly important for people that might tend to get a lot of legal requests for data. Um, basically, if you're, if you're getting legal requests for data that you already deleted because you have a routine um, data retention and data deletion policy, um, then you're off the hook. You don't have to provide information that you already deleted. Um, so this means like you might purge your logs after a month or after however long you think is needed. Um, um, to like, if you you might keep logs for some reason for like looking at system problems or um, you know malicious attacks to your website, it, it might make sense to keep logs for a month or two for that reason. But then you can have a retention policy that says, okay, we're gonna delete everything. And um, same with um, backups, you might not want to keep backups around forever because that could mean that there's sensitive information that you thought was deleted from your system, but you still have it around. And I mean, we've seen issues with data breaches where the breach affected a database backup that they didn't realize was still around on some file system somewhere. So a retention policy helps privacy, it also helps security because the data is not just sitting around. Um, and then um, obviously there's a lot of other regulations for different industries like healthcare, edu uh, education industries have HIPAA and FERPA and so there's other laws that you might need to be aware of for like sensitive information about people. Um, so kind of like I was uh, saying before, when you're in doubt about the privacy regulations, we would encourage people to um, 
take an affirmative pro privacy <laughs> stance and inform your users about um, all the data that's being collected and who's getting access to it. Um, request consent. And this is like finally come into the, the mainstream through the MeToo uh, movement and other things in the past few years. People are finally getting an understanding of what consent means and um, and so hopefully this can be applied to all of our like digital technology where we're getting consent to get information about our users and you know because we're providing a service and they're agreeing to everything that goes along with that. And um, and then allow users to opt in and opt out. So that might mean that maybe the checkbox defaults not being checked and they have to like opt in. And I think that's all regardless of what the law says, I think that's always a great policy. You're gonna get the trust of your users and um, and that can set you apart from your competitors that are doing shadier things. Um, so, a few more things. Um, I already talked about consent, but um, talk a little bit about data controller and data processor. So again, data processor is a GDPR thing. Um, it's it's just all of the third parties that are getting access to the to your user data. Um, and also the data protection officer is something that the GDPR requires for, um, for basically every company to have a designated person who's doing compliance for all of this privacy stuff. So obviously their job title might, might not be data protection officer, but whatever their job title is, one of their duties is to be the data protection officer. Um, and then uh, look at um, all the kind of industry standard privacy, uh, sorry, uh, security practices that you should be implementing for whatever you're building. Um, so that means maybe hiring uh, another firm to do like a security assessment for your system, um, do, doing what we call adversarial testing. That means if you're building some kind of application, maybe uh, rather than having the developer kind of sign off and say, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is secure, you actually bring in an, another person to kind of like look for weaknesses, um, security problems, and the application. If you have like a more adversarial mindset, you're more likely to discover problems um, than if you were the person who built it and kind of assumes that it's working correctly. So this is something that we do at EFF. We find, uh, usually we find people who can like donate a little time to us, it's quite expensive, but uh, people who work in security at bigger companies are sometimes willing to um, donate a security assessment if you're like a nonprofit organization. Uh, in the past, I know we used um, the Salesforce Red Team, and and basically, if you're doing a security assessment, they might do like basically whatever kinds of um, a security, uh, whatever kind of security assessment you you ask for. You can get like them to come to your physical building and try to gain entry. Um, or you can just say, please just test this website and nothing else. <laughs> so um, whatever whatever you think you might need, you can basically um, ask for. And I think if you are doing a real world security test, like that's what we you might call OPSEC, because it's operational security, that's gonna find a lot more potential issues because maybe, um, maybe your website is locked down, but then if you're on the company network, you have access to the admin, system through that particular IP address, and then uh, when someone comes, comes on site, they figure out a way to get on your Wi-Fi or plug into your network, and then they get access to something that you thought was locked down. So um, definitely think about security, not just in terms of like online security, but also like how that interacts with real world security, and like if somebody gets access to an unencrypted laptop, this one's actually encrypted, but... <laughs> I'm guessing not everyone in the room has disk encryption, so things like a laptop being left around could mean that somebody gets access to your company data, um, whether it's like on the device or just has access to some cloud service. So that would definitely tie into CCPA because if you had a lot of sensitive information and you had unencrypted laptops sitting around, people could get access to all of that consumer data and then maybe somebody would say that wasn't a reasonable um, security measure that you've had in place. Um, also, uh, if you have some kind of small business insurance, you want to look at 
if that's going to cover data breaches. And I know this from personal experience because I started a business a while back. But like basically, like a lot of insurance policies don't cover data breaches. <laughs> and so that means like with the new, yeah. I was going to say it's super expensive. It's yeah. A small agency, and our like cyber liability policy is like eight thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Which is cheap compared to if you have an issue. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's like another cost of doing business, unfortunately. Um, so I guess yeah, if they allow you to like fine tune the level of coverage, maybe that makes sense, but it could be expensive. Um, so you, you at least want some kind of data breach coverage because um, you never know what could happen if, you, um, if you're a small agency and you're building something for a client with deep pockets, I guess they could come after you and sue you. <laughs> um, so uh, finally, if there is a data breach, you want to have a procedure in place, um, kind of like roadmap for whoever you know gets in the unfortunate phone call or discovers some, some problem, they need to know you know who to who to talk to, how to inform your customers and users, what you know, how do you lock down the system, how do you do a forensic analysis to figure out what happened. All that should be kind of written up somewhere so that when you're panicking, you have some kind of game plan. So I really recommend having some written procedure for that, and it would be the same kind of thing you might have for a disaster response plan. Like what happens if there's an earthquake or you know one of our data centers goes down, you want to have some kind of plan for that. So this is a similar kind of thing where you just have some something written down like that you can follow. You're not going to cover every scenario, you're not going to know exactly where the data breach is going to be, but it's going to get you closer to doing the right thing. Um, so there's a lot of things that we're not sure. There's like little kind of gray areas in CCPA. Um, so users need to be able to opt out of having their information sold, but we don't know exactly how they're going to authenticate to do so. Um, like if somebody sends you a letter in the mail saying, I'm opting out, how do you know for sure that you know which user that is and if that's a legitimate request? So this is the kind of thing that we'll figure out over the next few months, but if you already have a user login system, maybe you add something in the account page where they can opt out. Or maybe uh, if you don't have that, if, if users are just interacting without logging into your site, then maybe you need to have some kind of email-based authentication where you send them an email and they're able to like authenticate, like, yes, I'm this person and I want to opt out. So that, that could be like a new system that you have to build, or maybe it's maybe it dovetails into something you already have. If you already have uh, email confirmation for signing up for the newsletter, you might, it might be easier to like add a new kind of email confirmation for signing up for, for opting out. Um, so I don't know how much time we have. Um, so, are we ending now, or what's the end time for? Yeah. Okay. So I'll just really quickly, and this is totally biased because I maintain some Drupal modules, so I'm sorry that I focused more on my own modules, but not entirely. <laughs> but I want to talk a little bit about um, if you're maintaining or building a site. Um, first of all, we definitely recommend using HTTPS because that means you're using encryption. So your user privacy is going to be that much better, and certainly for um, for the security of you know that the admin side of the site, you want to lock down the administrative passwords and things like that. So HTTPS means that um, it's going to be that much harder for um, someone to hack into your site. Um, so like I was saying before, CertBot is one of the EFF tools. We let you get a free uh, SSL certificate, also known as TLS. And um, if you still have an HTTP site, um, I happen to maintain this Google module, Spare Login. And it allows you to have an HTTP site, but also have an HTTPS site and make sure that when users are logging into your site, they're going through the secure version of the site. So I don't really think people should have an HTTP site, but since they do, uh, I maintain this module because it, it just makes it easier to roll out HTTPS while keeping the old version of the site around. Um, you just, you're basically, the anonymous users are seeing HTTP 
but as soon as they try to log in, they're going to HTTPS. And one thing that I thought was interesting was that, um, so the secure login module like slowly was gaining um, users of the module over time. And then it's really cool because it basically kind of like fell off a cliff around the time that GDPR went into effect. And I, I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming this is because all of the sites in Europe went HTTPS only. You no longer need a secure login module. That module is only useful if you still have the HTTP site. So this is kind of a good example of how privacy laws can actually result in real world improvements to security practices. And so we might see that with CCPA, where more sites are uh, making technical changes. Um, another thing to look at is content security policy. How many people are familiar with this? OK, not very many. So this is a HTTP header that a website can put out. And it basically allows you to have a policy for what third party URLs are allowed to um, be opened within your web page. Uh, it also allows you to lock down other things like you can block inline JavaScript using the CSP. So that means, um, or iframes for that matter. So if you allow people to add HTML for your content management system, I'm sure some Drupal sites out there do that. Um, <laughs> so you, you might run into the problem where people are adding random JavaScript and other sketchy things to your, to your HTML. The CSP allows you to basically lock that down and say, actually, no inline JavaScript can run. Um, for YouTube or something. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, historically, this was tricky to implement with Drupal because Drupal had, has a lot of inline JavaScript and a lot of themes and modules pull in JavaScript for and from other like third party services. So this is not like an easy thing to just turn it on. But one thing that you can do is uh, put it on report only mode. So rather than blocking third party services, you just get a uh, ping every time a third party URL loads in the page. And then you can basically develop a list and find out which third party services you're using on your site. And that's actually how many EFF sites still work because they were built a long time ago and we couldn't unilaterally turn on a really strict CSP. We had to basically put it in report only mode. Someday we'll rebuild all of our websites and they'll be built correctly, but that <laughs> takes time. So, um, and there's some Drupal modules that really help this out, so security kit module, and there's some others that I haven't used, but there's certainly others out there too. And, and they have the interface for turning on the content security policy and getting the report class. Um, so some some of these modules actually report the CSP violations to a third party service. So that's like yet another third party service that might be getting data about your users. I would say it's better to report the CSP violations to your own site or a site that you control, but some people like the convenience of like putting everything in the cloud and having somebody else's computer gather all the data and they can analyze it at their leisure. So obviously huge privacy pros and cons there. But um, a lot of people like to, to use um, CDN uh, URLs, third party CDN URLs for their JavaScript libraries and fonts. Um, one thing that I found was actually like those don't necessarily speed up the web page because the web page has to make more DNS queries to get all of the URLs for all the different um, third party resources in the page. So uh, if you actually have all of the resources bundled into your site on your own domain name, it could actually be faster. And uh, also with new um, technologies like HTTP2, you can basically pipeline all of the HTTP requests into one request. So you can basically load all of the resources in the page at maximum velocity through uh, one connection to your own web server. And so that, so there's really no like clear um, performance gain for putting 
all your resources on remote third-party sites. But that's certainly going to be an argument that people can make. But I would say people should benchmark it and find out if they're using a third-party service, like make sure it really is faster before you just assume it is. Um, so third-party iframes are huge. People don't usually like to post their own video. They want to use something like YouTube to post the video. So that means that Google is gathering all of our viewing habits and streaming ads to us. So that has like huge privacy implications. Um, there's no easy solution for that. You can't easily build around YouTube. But one thing that we made at EFF is something called MyTube. And so this at least, when the page loads, you have the blog post and there's an embedded YouTube video, but it's basically just a, a preview a screenshot of the video. And it says, this will, if you click this, it will load the video from YouTube.com. People have to affirmatively click that. And then a request is finally made to YouTube.com. And YouTube, you know, at that point, the user has consented to sending all of their data to YouTube, and but at least they had to click something. And so we think that's a huge privacy gain for third-party iframes. So um, unfortunately, my two module doesn't have very many people using it. <laughs> but um, and we also don't have a Drupal 8 version of it, we still are stuck on Drupal 7. But if anybody here is interested in a new version of my two for Drupal 8, like please make it or talk to me. I was gonna say the new Drupal 8 video with uh, video field yeah. uh, has a default that just embeds a thumbnail. Then you click it, then it replaces it with oh, a iframe. Cool, so I didn't like, know that. So maybe we don't need it. For... Similar thing. That's great. I had it doesn't yeah. give you a warning, which could be coded in below it, but it does that by default. But you have to awesome. click to. Okay. File. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that. So maybe my tube is obsolete, um, but I'll have to research that. Um, so web analytics are really popular. Um, most people use Google Analytics, I guess, these days. But um, so Google Analytics means that Google is getting all of the information about what your users are doing on your website. And so this is something that you could disclose in your privacy policy if that's what you decide to do. But I do want to mention that there are alternatives. There's something called Modimo, which is an open source analytics platform. So you can post it yourself or use somebody else's Modimo um, instance. You can use the official modimo.org version of it if you want. You have to pay them a monthly fee. But it, it gives you an alternative for who's collecting all the data by your users. And because it's open source, you can really easily customize it. Um, so at EFF, we try to follow our own best practices so we don't fingerprint the users coming to our site. And um, so by using Modimo, we're able to basically record page views without having JavaScript running that's like setting cookies and trying to fingerprint every single user on our, or every visitor to our website because uh, we don't care about that. Uh, so we have this module called Pubic NoScript. Pubic is the old name of Modimo. But this basically allows you to embed the tracking code um, in a way that it's not fingerprinting anyone. So that that's probably like the most privacy friendly way to do web analytics. Um, the downside, if you don't fingerprint people and if you don't set cookies on the browser, then you have no way of really knowing for sure if someone is the same visitor or someone else because you don't have really accurate information about um, who they are and and which web, web browser you're using, and if they, and whether or not they visited your site already, because there's no cookies around. So if you, in our case, we don't care. We basically decided, you know, we don't really care if somebody came to our website yesterday and came back. We we just want to see how many people read all of our various blog posts, so we can kind of find out which issues people care about more, which which um, which issues they're sharing more on social media and all of that. So. We're fine having this kind of dumbed-down analytics, uh, but I think that's like something that everyone has to decide for themselves. Like, if, you, if it's really important for you to fingerprint all of, you, all of your visitors, then I guess you can do that, and um, Modimo will also work that way if you want to fingerprint everyone. And um, if you're interested in seeing how fingerprinting works, we actually have this website called notdeclick.eff.org, and this is a basic demonstration of how unique your browser is because everyone has 
uh, different like physical parameters of their device. They're coming from um, you know different version of a web browser. Their screen size is different. The fonts that they have installed are different. So there's a lot of um, information that, you, especially using JavaScript, you can pull all this information from the browser, and you end up getting a very unique fingerprint for the visitors coming to your site. And so that's what Basically, all web analytics use this, uh, whether it's Modimo or Google Analytics. They're, they're doing fingerprinting to try to figure out who everyone is. Um, one interesting thing about fingerprinting is that um, the Apple products actually do a very good job, relatively good job, of making people more anonymous because of the fact that Apple devices are a lot more locked down. It's a lot harder for people to um, change the, you know, the fonts that are installed on their iPhone. And um, obviously, like iPhones have standard screen sizes and things, and there aren't that many types of iPhones. So, if you click on, if you go to panopticlick.eff.org, and you're using an Apple device, you're um, less likely to be a unique visitor, according to the fingerprinting that we do. But you might be, so if you want to try it out and see what it says. But chances are you'll be a unique visitor because everyone, you know, probably on at least one of your devices, you have. Something about your laptop makes it unique, and, and you can be fingerprinted that way. So, um, okay, one, might be running out of time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, I'll just say really quickly, um, uh, as far as retention policies for um, data that you're logging, um, for IP addresses, um, I have a couple of modules that allow you to scrub the IP addresses from, your, from the logs that are in your Drupal database tables. So one of those is um, IP Anonymize, and this allows you to set uh, a retention uh, period for the IP addresses for like, you know, comment table and session table. These, set, these can have a different retention policy, so you can decide, oh, I want to save the IP address in the comment table for a week so I can figure out if it's a spammer and I want to decide to block that IP address. Um, and Drupal actually makes it pretty easy to build this kind of thing. You know, it has the hooks for hooking into data being uh, saved and cron, cron jobs can be created to go back and scrub the data. So this is something that you can easily customize if you wanted to be able to scrub other kinds of data. The IP anonymized module is basically like a, like a simple example what you can do with Drupal. And also I made something called Cryptolog, which actually immediately anonymizes the IP address before it even goes into the database at all. Um, and so what this does is it actually creates a salted hash of the IP address. So it's um, much harder for someone to figure out what the IP address is. And because it, it actually, it's a salted hash, it stores the salt in memory. So um, basically, Forensic methods might allow you to like reverse engineer what an IP address was, but it's pretty um, pretty well anonymized. So, that's about it. I guess we have like one minute for questions. <laughs> I'll start. Yeah, I'll. Yeah, I don't know who I'm supposed to send them to, but I'll. I think you can upload them. Upload them. No, no. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I'll do that. Yeah. Um. I had a question on like privacy policy stuff. Have you seen or heard of IU? I can't pronounce the name. It's I U B E N D A at the end um, It's a privacy policy generation service, and okay. you basically go through and say, "I'm using Google Analytics. I'm using this. I'm using that." They now have a script that sort of uses like built with type of technology. It goes through and looks for all that stuff on your website and says, here's the 14 services you're needed and here's the privacy policy. It actually, so it finds the analytics that you're using. Yeah, it figures out what tools you're using. It goes, hey, you have a web form with 14 fields. Uh, what are those fields? And like a name, phone number, this, that. And you just select it on the list of check boxes and then it goes, here's the privacy policy. And so they That's have great. a team of like lawyers who go and check Google Analytics and all these ones and then basically sort of build the Google Analytics one, and each one, and then you just check out, I need this one, this one, this one, this one. It's a paid service. Uh, but it's it's a really nice. Cool. What's it, that? Agenda. It's I-U-B-E-N-D-A.com. 
and it creates your privacy policy and the um, cleaning policy in that. It's really nice, and it's relatively inexpensive. It's like Rocket Lawyer for privacy policies. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, but it's cheaper than hiring. Yeah, it's cheaper than paying a, a, a lawyer for one hour a year. Yeah. I guess. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. And the CTAs or do you have any interesting around? Um, is it opting in to agree to a privacy policy kind of thing with GDPR, <coughs> or is it they're not? That's not what they're talking about. All they're talking about opt-in is just the sale of your data. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the the CCPA um, basically just means you have to have a privacy policy, and just and it's assumed that people are opting into it. But you do need to affirmatively opt in. Uh, or you need to be able to permanently opt out of certain things like having your data stored. So the privacy policy could say, so if your privacy you policy will, changes, you don't have to necessarily inform yeah. everybody that it's changed. I mean, you should, but yeah. if you don't, you're not in violation. Right. Um, how about backups as far as, like, if you say I want all my stuff to be deleted, what's the expectation that's been set by this as far as what needs to be scrubbed out of your backups? Um, the law doesn't really say anything about that. As far as I read, um, there's going to be guidance thrown in the Attorney General, so they might say more. I would assume that ideally they would want the data to be scrubbed from all of your systems, but that you could argue that it's not reasonable if it came down to it. Yeah.